Let's see. What we did so far was a lot of fun, but is it useful for anything? Um, I suppose the answer is going to be yes. Okay, that these metacircular interpreters are a valuable thing to play with. I spend, say, well, there have been times I spend 50% of my time over a year trying various design alternatives by experimenting with them with metacircular interpreters. Metacircular interpreters, like the sort you just saw, metacircular is because they're defined in terms of themselves in such a way that the language they interpret contains itself. Okay. Such interpreters are a convenient medium for exploring language issues. If you want to try adding a new feature, it's sort of a snap. It's easy. You just do it and see what happens. You play with that language for a while. You say, gee, I didn't like that. You throw it away. Okay, or you might want to uh, see what the difference is if you'd make a slight difference in the binding strategy or some or more complicated things that might occur. In fact, these metacircular interpreters are an excellent medium for people exchanging, exchanging ideas about language design. Because they're pretty easy to understand, and they're short and compact and simple, uh, if I have some idea that I want somebody to criticize, like, say, uh, Dan Friedman at, at Indiana, I know, write a little metacircular interpreter and send him some network mail with this interpreter, and he can whip it up on his machine and play with it and say, that's no good. <laughs> and then send it back to me and say, well, why don't you try this one? It's a little better. Okay. So I want to show you some of that technology. See, because really it's the, it's the essential simple technology for getting started in, in designing your own languages for particular purposes. So let's start by adding a very simple feature to a list. <clears throat> Now, one thing I want to tell you about is features before I start. Okay. There are many languages that have made a mess of themselves by adding huge numbers of features. Computer scientists have a joke about bugs that transform into features all the time. But I like to think of it as that Many systems suffer from what's called creeping featureism, which is that you know, George has a pet p feature he'd like in the system, so he adds it. And then Harry says, goes, says well, I, gee, this system is no longer what exactly I like, so I'm going to add my fa favorite feature. Okay, and then, then Jim adds his favorite feature. And after a while, the thing has a manual 500 pages long that no one can understand. And sometimes it's the same person who writes all of these features and produces this terribly complicated thing. Now, some, in some cases, like editors, it's sort of reasonable to have lots of features because there are a lot of things you want to be able to do, and many of them are arbitrary. But in computer languages, I think that's a disaster to have too much stuff in them. The other alternative you get into is something called feeping creaturism, which is where you have a box which has a, a display, a fancy display, and a mouse, and you get into uh, well, there's all sorts of complexity associated with all this fancy I.O. And your computer language becomes a dismal little tiny thing that barely works because of all the swapping and disk twitching and so on caused by your Windows system. And every time you go near the computer, the mouse process wakes up and says, gee, uh, have you something for me to do? And then it goes back to sleep. And if you accidentally push the mouse with your elbow, a uh, big puff of smoke comes out of your computer and things like that. So two ways to disastrously destroy a system by adding features. But let's try right now add a little simple feature. <clears throat> this actually is a good one. And in fact, real, real lisps have it. As you've seen, there are procedures like 
like plus n times that take any number of arguments. So we can write things like the sum of the product of a and x and x and the product of b and x and c. As you can see here, addition takes three arguments or two arguments. Multiplication takes two arguments or three arguments, taking numbers of arguments, all of which are to be treated in the same way. And this is a, a valuable thing, indefinite numbers of arguments. Yet the particular Lisp system that I showed you is one where the numbers of arguments is fixed. Because I had to match the arguments against the formal parameters in the binder, where there's a pair up. Well, I'd like to be able to define new procedures like this that can have any number of arguments. Well, there's several parts to this problem. The first part is coming up with a syntactic specification, some way of notating the additional arguments, of which you don't know how many there are. And then there is the other thing, which is once we've notated it, how are we going to interpret that notation so as to do the right thing, whatever the right thing is? So let's consider an example of the sort of thing we might want to be able to do. So an example might be that I might want to be able to define a procedure which is a procedure of one required argument, x, and a non-required, and a, a bunch of arguments, I don't know how many there are, called y. So x is required. And there are many y's, many arguments, which we call y will be the list of them. Now, with such a thing, we might be able to say something like map, we're going to do something to every one, of that procedure of one argument u which multiplies x by u, and we'll apply that to y. I've used a dot here to indicate that the thing after this is a list of all the rest of the arguments. I'm making a syntactic specification. Now, what this depends upon the reason why this is sort of a reasonable thing to do okay, is because this happens to be a syntax that's used in the Lisp reader for representing consists. You've never introduced that before. You've never seen. You may have seen when playing with the system that if you const two things together, you get the first space dot the second uh, space. The first space dot space the second with parentheses around the whole thing. So that, for example, this x dot y corresponds to a pair which has got an x in it and a y in it. The, more, the other notations that you've seen so far are things like, like a procedure, a procedure of arguments x and y and z, which do things. And that, that looks like, just looking at the bound variable list, it looks like this. x, y, z, and the empty thing. If I have a list of arguments I wish to match this against, supposing I have a list of arguments 1, 2, 3, I want to match these against. Okay. So I might have here a list of three things. One, two, three. Okay, and I want to match x, y, z against one, two, three. Well, it's clear that the 1 matches the x because I can just sort of follow the structure. And the 2 matches the, the, 
the y, and the 3 matches the z. But now, supposing I were to compare this, x dot y. This is x dot y. Supposing I compare that with the list of three arguments, 1, 2, 3. Let's look at that again. One, two, three. Well, I can look and I can walk along here and say, oh yes, x matches the one. Huh. The y matches the list, which is two and three. So the notation that I'm choosing here is one that's very natural for the Lisp system. But I'm going to choose this as a notation for representing a bunch of arguments. Now there's an alternative possibility, which is if I don't want to take one special out, or two special ones out, or something like that. Okay? If I don't want to do that, if I want to talk about just the list of all the arguments, like an addition, well then the argument list, I'm going to choose to be that procedure of all the arguments x, which do, does something with x. Okay? Which, for example, if I take the procedure which, is, which takes all the arguments x and returns the list of them, okay, that's list. That's the procedure list. So this is. Okay. How does this work? Well, indeed, what I had as the bound variable list in this case, whatever it is, is being matched against the list of arguments. This symbol now is all of the arguments. And so this is the choice I'm making for a particular syntactic specification for the description of procedures which take indefinite numbers of arguments. There are two cases of it, this one and this one. And none of these, when you make syntactic specifications, it's important that it's unambiguous. That neither of these can be confused with a, a representation we already have, this one. I can always tell whether I have a fixed number of explicitly named arguments, named by these formal parameters, or a fixed number of named formal parameters followed by a thing which picks up all the rest of them, or a, a, a list of all, of, the form, of all the arguments which will be matched against this particular formal parameter called x, because these are syntactically distinguishable. Okay. Many languages make terrible errors in that form, where whole segments of interpretation are cut off because there are, there are syntactic ambiguities in, la in the language. There have been traditional problems with algo-like languages having to do with the nesting of ifs in the, in the, uh, in the predicate part. In any case, now so I've told you about the syntax, now what are we going to do about the, semantic, the semantics of this? How do we interpret it? Well, this is just super easy. I'm going to modify the metacircular interpreter to do it. That's a one-liner. There it is. I'm changing the way you pair things up. Okay. Here we have the procedure that pairs Here's the procedure that pairs um, the variables, the formal parameters, with the arguments that were passed from the last, from the last description of the metacircular interpreter. And here are some things that are the same as they were before. In other words, if the list of variables is empty, then if the list of values is empty, then I, have the, then I have an empty list. Otherwise, I have too many arguments. If I have, that is, if I have empty variables, but non-empty values. If I have empty values, okay, but no, the variables are not empty, I have too few arguments. However, if I have a variable, the variables are a symbol. interesting case. Then what I should do 
you say, oh yes, this is the special case that I have a symbolic tail. Okay? I have here a uh, thing just like we looked over here. This is a tail which is a symbol. Why? It's not an ill. It's not the empty list. Here's a symbolic tail. It's just the very beginning is the tail. There's nothing else. In that case, I wish to match the, that list of va that variable with all the values and, and add that to the, to, uh, the pairing that I'm making. Otherwise, I go through the normal, the normal arrangement of making up a whole pairing. I suppose that's very simple, and that's all there is to it. And now I'll answer some questions. The first one. Are there any questions? Yes? Could you explain that uh, third form? The I third form, this one? Yeah. OK. Well, maybe we should look at the, whole, the, the thing as a, as a piece of list structure. Okay. This is a procedure which contains a lambda. I'm just looking at the list structure which represents this. Is, represents this. Here's x. These are, these are symbols. And then their body is nothing but x. Okay. If I were looking for the bound variable list part of this procedure, I would go looking at the catter, and I'd find a symbol. So the matcher, which is this pair-up thing I just showed you, is going to be matching a symbolic object against the list of, uh, of arguments that were passed. And it will bind that symbol to the, to the list of arguments. The, in this case, if I'm looking for, looking for it, the match will be against this in the bound variable list position. Okay. Now, if what this does is it gets a list of arguments and returns it, that's list. That's what the procedure is. Oh well, thank you. Let's uh, take a break.